message this morning is surprised by God. Surprised by God. Growing up, I always looked forward to my family summer vacations. My father was a school teacher, so he had uh, the summers off uh, for the most part. My mother worked part time, and so we always had an opportunity to go away for a week or two during the summer, and we were very, very thankful for those opportunities because they were opportunities of, of learning and growth. And you know, a sense of excitement. And anticipation would fill me as a child in the days leading up to road trip. Because we always took a, a road trip. Never, never flew. And uh, you know, that classic hit on the road again would always be playing inside of my head. But I was excited to get out of that small town of Maslin, Ohio, and see parts of the country I had yet to see. And so here we are in this first Sunday of Easter and our scripture on this first Sunday after Easter, which as I was telling Barb this morning is traditionally called Low Sunday uh, in uh, many church traditions because it's the Sunday after Easter and typically after all the excitement of the big resurrection Sunday, you know, attendance wanes and whatnot and considered Low Sunday. But on this Sunday, we get a glimpse of Jesus with two of his disciples after that first Easter. And the story begins with Jesus and two of his followers on the road between Jerusalem and a small village called Emmaus. One of the disciples is named Cleopas, as we heard at read. The other is not named, but some think it was Cleopas' wife. You may think it's an accident that in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus first shows up to two of his followers on the road. But it's not an accident. Because in Luke's Gospel, he takes us on the road as frequently almost as my family went on road trips as a child. Think about the Gospel of Luke. It starts off with Jesus' parents burying Joseph on the road journeying to Jerusalem journeying to Bethlehem. When Jesus was 12, his parents took a road trip, as they did every day, every year, to Jerusalem for Passover. A road was setting for the parable of the Good Samaritan. A road leads the parable and the prodigal and the parable of the prodigal son. A road leads him back to his father. This Lenten season, we traveled with Jesus from Galilee, from Luke chapter 9, verse 51, when Jesus sets his face towards Jerusalem, and we traveled with him all the way through Luke chapter 19 to Jerusalem, and along the way he met many people, you might recall the blind beggar on the, on the way to Jericho, or his encounter with Zacchaeus, who was up in the tree. In fact, Luke continues this theme in the book of Acts. The story of Saul, who became Paul, meets God on the Damascus, on the road to Damascus. There's something about travel that arouses Luke's theological and literary imagination. Roads become a symbol of faith on the move. And in fact, the Christians were first known, Christians were first known, not as Christians, but as people of the way, book of Acts. So this is a, a fitting metaphor for relationship with Jesus, discipleship, following Jesus. And so it shouldn't surprise us that Luke brings his gospel to a close with this story of his two disciples walking on the road to a man. As we heard Pat read the story, we realize that it's filled with irony, filled with misunderstanding, filled with a bit of a plot twist and a dramatic reveal at the end. They're all narrative devices that make for an interesting and memorable story. It also weaves together Luke's themes of hospitality and table fellowship and discipleship. 
We're told that on the first Easter Sunday, two of Jesus' followers were walking toward Emmaus, a seven-mile journey. from And we don't know why they're going there. Perhaps they are returning to their home after the Passover feast. Uh, perhaps they are fearful and they are getting out of Jerusalem for fear of what may happen to Jesus' followers. We don't know exactly. But we know that they are walking and they are talking about all these things that have happened. And in that conversation, Jesus comes up and joins them. What are you talking about? As listeners to the story, we already know the answer. They were talking about current events. They were talking about the news. They were specifically talking about political news. Because the things that had happened included Jesus' crucifixion by the Romans, and crucifixion by the Romans was a political act. And Luke tells us that like many today, Cleopas and his companions have, have lost hope in the face of this distressing news. They stood still looking sad. Their, their faces were, were downcast. And in response, Cleopas says to Jesus, says, are you the only stranger? Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have taken place the last few days? Jesus asks another question. What thing? Then Cleopas declares in response in past tense what has happened. He tells this stranger the stranger the things of Jesus. A prophet mighty in deed, in word before God and all the people. He was condemned to death and was crucified, but we had hoped it was the one who would... Then he goes on to tell, further perplexing to us, right, was that some of our woman folk found the tomb empty, but could not see. They saw a vision of angels who said he was alive, and some of our fellow followers went to the tomb. It was empty, but they didn't see. The irony, of course, right, is that Cleopas' story is that they hoped that Jesus would fulfill the Scripture. But they saw his death, which was indeed the fulfillment of scriptures. But they saw his, his death only as frustration. Frustration of the The irony, of course, in this story further is that they were perplexed that the tomb was empty, confused that Peter had seen the tomb empty but had not seen Jesus. But now they themselves, we know as the readers and listeners of the story, they themselves are talking. But they still do not understand. And they do not understand or perceive it as him. Right? The greatest irony is that they themselves are kept from recognizing. You ever wonder what kept them from recognizing Jesus' presence? The scripture doesn't tell us, it doesn't say, but we cannot know for sure. But was it their grief? Perhaps. Did Jesus look different after his resurrection? Wearing a funny mask with a silly mustache? Probably not. That was great. Look at that. Right on cue. <laughs> I didn't know that line was that funny. I love Woody Woodpecker, by the way. Great cartoon. We don't know why they couldn't keep from seeing Jesus. But perhaps I wonder if they couldn't see Jesus because in part they think they already understood what was happening. They already understood what was happening. Cleopas said to him, are you the only one, the only stranger, the only visitor who doesn't know what has happened? How could you not know? It's been a trending topic, you know. Found Jesus' crucifixion, you know, it's a trending on Twitter. Are you clueless? Commenting on this passage, Michael Beth Dinkler writes, what if the disciples cannot recognize Jesus because their opinions are already fully formed? 
What if they can't recognize because their opinions are already fully formed? Pause for a moment and think about how we form our opinions about Jesus or about God, about the world, and our role as his followers in it. We inherit from those around us perhaps certain assumptions, beliefs, and our opinions grow out of those assumptions beliefs, and like the disciples on that road, our assumptions shape what we talk about, and what we talk about shapes what we see. Dinkler writes, what we talk about matters, what we pay attention to grows. The stories we tell confirm certain beliefs and not others. And she asks the question, how many of us keep telling the same stories to those who already agree with us? How many of us keep listening to the same stories again and again to reinforce our present assumption? In my weekly email to the congregation, I, I mentioned that this scripture is, is one of my, my favorite passages. It's a favorite because not only do I like the narrative story and the memorable narrative that it is, but I've experienced this passage in my own life. I think previously I've, I've shared with you my college experience participating in a communal discipleship experience called the Peniel House. The name of that house is taken from Genesis 32 where Jacob wrestles with God and wrestles with an angel before Jacob is reconciled to his brother Esau. But I'm not sure if I've spoken about the experience I had after college when I chose to live with a group of other recent college graduates in an intentional community house which we called the Emmaus house. Our hope for that community, the, the design was that we would travel with one another through our young adulting years. And we lived in a community that was different from what most of us knew growing up. We worked at various places of employment in that neighborhood, in that community, larger community around us, served in that community, tried to be neighborly to our neighbors. We studied the scriptures together and we listened to stories, some of them new stories, stories of our neighbors. And I remember there's one particular book that we read, that we read together. It was called Crossing. A White Man's Journey into Black America by Walt Harrington. Now Walt, he was one day in the dentist office and he was a journalist and he heard a racist joke that left him raised. He was married to a black woman and he, was a, and he was a father of two biracial children and his experience in that dentist office made him realize that not only that the, that the joke was about his own children but also that he really knew very little about what it was like a black person in America. And so he set off on a 25,000 mile journey through America, talking with scores of black and white people along the way, including an old sharecropper, a city police chief, a jazz trumpeter, a convicted murderer, a welfare mother, and a corporate mogul. And in that book, he related what he learned as he listened. And I remember together in our house, we, we, we listened to the stories in that book. We, we listened to, to new voices that we encountered through relationships and conversations with our neighbors. And as a result, our assumptions were remolded. What we talked about changed. What we saw and what we understood of God's call to be and to do in the world was transformed. We were surprised by God. Getting back to the original Emmaus narrative, after Cleopas catches the stranger to Jerusalem up about the current events of the day. Jesus responds with a bit of teaching. We're told that he explains to them all that had to happen to himself 
beginning with Moses and the And yet, the dramatic tension increases in that moment because even their Bible study with Jesus doesn't lead the disciples to recognize him. As they approach Emmaus, Jesus acts as if further, but they urge him strongly, stay with us. They offer hospitality to strangers. And so he goes in with them. And there we're told that he sits at table, he takes bread, he gives thanks, breaks it, he begins to give it to them. And it's in that communal sharing of a meal that their eyes are opened and they recognize. In the moment, the guest becomes the host. Now you may remember these words that he takes, he breaks, he blesses, and he gives. Words of Eucharist, of communion, but also words when Jesus fed the 5,000. I think it means that Jesus is not only celebrated in communion, but that every meal can be an event in which hospitality, table fellowship, some sacred occasion. And that was another characteristic of both my Peniel and Emmaus experiences. Having meals, having meal, sitting down for meals with strangers. Well, really not strangers per se, but let's call them acquaintances. People I, I knew but didn't really know. Next door neighbors. A local pastor. Too. Neighborhood children. Counter. Landlord. Co-workers. Housemate. Here's a point of practical application. We'll leave from this place this morning, and many of us will go to lunch. Some of us will go to our homes. Others will go out to a restaurant. But we'll sit at the table, we'll sit at the table, perhaps with the same people week after week. Or perhaps we could invite an acquaintance. A stranger to a meal with us. Open ourselves to the surprising ways of God, and in that meal, perhaps we'll encounter a sacred moment. Yesterday afternoon, I had the delight of sharing a meal with two church members after Jeanette sent memorial service. And I realize it's one of those things I've really missed during COVID. Is Sitting down at table with breaking bread and listening. It was a, a sacred occasion to be with them. Christ present. What we talk about matters. What we pay attention to grows. Stories we tell confirm certain beliefs, not others. It's easy to stay in our echo chambers, but I've come by this morning to testify that like the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, God will show up, God will surprise us with God's presence, will experience transformation, fight, stranger, acquaintance, stay and to break bread. Closing the sermon this morning, I want to draw our attention to what commentator Alan Culpepper drew my attention to last week, something I had never noticed in the Gospel of Luke. In sharing their bread with a stranger, Cleopas and his companion experienced an unplanned sacred moment. They recognized the risen Lord as a fellow traveler. He points out in his commentary that this meal at Emmaus is the counterpart in Luke's Gospel to the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. In that parable, the rich man feasts daily but never notices the beggar at his gates or shares his bread with him. Then as the story goes on from Hades, the rich man pleads with Abraham to send Lazarus back to warn his brother, but Abraham responds to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, 
neither will they be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Parallel in the story. Moses and the prophets and the resurrection from the dead. The story again pivots at a table. The difference, of course, is that Cleopas and his companion share table fellowship with a stranger and are surprised by God's presence. The rich man took no notice of the beggar until it was too late. Imagine for a moment. What might the rich man have discovered, had discovered? What he might have discovered, shared his bread with Lazarus. What might we discover? Take the time to share bread with one another. Newcomers, acquaintances. I think the promise of the text is. God will surprise us with God's presence. The lies. Prison. Our response to him is number 229. Our God reigns. Verses 1 